If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. What's up, Pumpheads? This is Sal here. Uh, on the way back from the Spartan races last weekend, we had the awesome opportunity of sitting down with Rob Wolf, uh, a good friend of ours. He's uh, a huge figure in the wellness, paleo, uh, health community. He wrote a fantastic book, Wired to Eat. In fact, it's a book that me, Adam, and Justin reference all the time. Highly recommend people read it. The information in there is excellent. Anyhow, in this episode, uh, we talk about a lot of things. Rob gets a little unglued on a few subjects, which is hilarious. The guy's hilarious. Uh, and we talk about business in here as well, but mostly about wellness and health. We have a great conversation. I know you're going to enjoy this interview. You can find Rob Wolf online on his website. It's Rob, O R O B B Wolf, W O L F dot com. So that's R O B B W O L F dot com. You can find him on Instagram at DOS, D A S Wolf. Uh, that's his Instagram page. Um, and also, I want to talk about uh, one of our, our bundles that we don't talk about a whole lot that I get a lot of questions on, and that's our Build Your Butt bundle. So the Build Your Butt bundle is MAPS Aesthetic and MAPS Anabolic. We took both programs, we combined them, and then we added some modifications designed to get your glutes to fire more effectively so that when you do your squats and deadlifts and lunges, you get the glutes to do more of the work so you get that butt building effect from them and that's what this bundle is all about it's the build your butt bundle comes with two maps programs if you were to run those programs back to back you're looking at about six months of exercise programming if you combine them together with the mod now you're doing the build your butt uh bundle uh kind of configuration uh you can find that at mindpumpmedia.com so without any further ado here's me adam and justin talking to our gr- good friend Rob Wolf. Man, we just had the uh, 2017 Spartan Championship race. We were actually hoping to run into Rob while we were down there, but uh, you got uh, you got tied up a little bit. Uh, killing, it was against my parole uh, 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 obligations <laughs> to go to California. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we, you know, it's funny. So we have a little three acre farm, and like this time of year is kind of critical for getting everything buttoned up and winterized and and all that type of stuff. And as as part of that, this didn't specifically keep me away from Spartan, but we get flood irrigation. And when the field floods, uh, mice and other critters die. And my dogs went out there and ate these partially decomposing animals. And then middle of the night last night, they started pooing and spewing from both ends. And um, at some point I checked out and I put the earplugs in. I'm like, okay, Nikki, you're up. I've got an 8 a.m. Uh, <laughs> interview with the Mind Pump oh, guy. Gosh. Oh, so oh, you're welcome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we got you yes. that one, buddy. <laughs> Hashtag. Yeah. We, I had my dog not that long ago drank, so my neighbor must, and I don't know if they use Roundup or some sort of chemicals or whatever, but they were washing. And then we get this little runoff of mm. water that was in my backyard. Roundup's and, perfectly safe, dude. Yeah, oh, yeah I drink it. On our yeah. food and breakfast. my dogs must have drank out of it. And then the, the next day, it was the biggest scare I'd ever had for with the dogs. Um, I mean, he just he couldn't move. He couldn't get up, and he was disoriented. I tried to I tried to pick him up. He started crying, freaking. I mean, I freaked out. Rushed him down to the hospital, and it literally took us all day long to try and you know process of elimination. What could it be? You know, we didn't leave this out. We didn't do this. And then I see this like pool of water that just, it just and you look at it and it just looks disgusting and it's a runoff from the neighbors next door the toxic sludge. yeah so nice. but nothing i could do about it man i would be that i'd be worried about mice and them eating that and them getting sick like to the point where they could die from that i would think yeah and i mean i i tease my wife each time the dog comes up and licks her i'm like yeah that's plague lick right there like he's <laughs> licking you with plague you know and I, I'm, I'm still searching for the upside of dog ownership like i've always been a cat guy i had a dog when i was a little kid didn't have one until my wife shook me down on this and I'm still kind of like, I'm not seeing the upside on any of this stuff, but so before we, before we got on air, we were actually, and I love to talk to people like you, um, about what they're going through with, with business. And, uh, 
it looks like you're getting ready to enter into the click funnel world and start diving into Facebook advertising. And you're somebody who pretty much has grown organically since you've started. And now you're heading that direction. What that, led That's you a know? polite way of saying that I had no fucking idea what I was doing. <laughs> and I just typed and talked and expected something good to happen. You were so good. good you didn't have to do happened. any of it. Well, right. it's, it's probably deceiving, like you said, because, I mean, you were part of a lot of the CrossFit when it first started and just kind of probably exploded with that. You're putting out great content. Um, I mean, for sure, Paleo has now become attached to CrossFit. So it's probably kind of, uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to probably tell that you weren't doing all the things that you could be doing. You right. probably were crushing it right out the gates and never thought twice. Why did you or what led you to start to look into this? What did you? You know, some of it, it's interesting. So we became more savvy about what's going on within Facebook and, and Google. Like we, we talked again a little bit before rolling like Google in particular is interesting in that they're trying to curate and own medicine and health and fitness. So if you put in a search term like bench press or something like that, Google will typically now provide a curated response and it doesn't go to any person or individual or organization site. It's something that Google decided to curate and you've got to work your way down the list quite a bit before you get to the first paid ads you know, with response to bench press. And then eventually you get down to the stuff that's actually good shit, you know, and, and who actually goes through all that. Yeah, right. right. And, and fewer and fewer people will go through that process. And so we just noticed that we were kind of moving into a cul-de-sac, you know, where no matter how good the content was that we generated, you know, I mean, it, uh, downloads on podcasts were good, but not spectacular website traffic was good. But again, you know, there, there wasn't this, uh, a really, a spectacular element to it. And so we started kind of kicking some doors and, and talking to people and they were like, yeah, so these click funnels and doing, uh, uh, you know, figuring out how you're going to do some of the paid advertising and whatnot. And what we're trying to figure out how to do is to not make it the like 30 pages of scrolling HTML text, even though that stuff clearly works. Like it just works, you right. know, it's kind of funny for a number of years, I kind of, you know, as a badge of honor, I'm like, yeah, I don't do any of those like seven steps to paleo abs type things. And then we were just at this event where there were people and we, we talked about this, like there are people who don't have nearly as much reach as I do. And they're pulling down like $2 million a month. And what do they do? Seven steps to paleo abs. Yeah. Like, oh, this God. is the you challenge. Know? This is yeah. where I wanted yeah. to go with you because this is something that uh, we've struggled with yeah, we since we started is – you know, if you do want to make a lot of money on the web, there are all these clickbaity things that you have to do. And guys like yourself, who I know have a lot of integrity, this has got to be a major challenge. Like, like how do you do that? How do I get their attention yeah. like everybody else does without doing what everybody else does? I'm not totally sure. Like, <laughs> we're still in the process of, of kind of motoring through that. What One thing, so we're working on a, and have finished this thing called the Keto Masterclass. And so... I put a ton of effort into that. Now, I would say that the technicality on it is geared for something that would be appropriate to like the uh, the Weight Watchers crowd, but it, it, it would push them. Like they're going to understand a little bit about like beta oxidation of fatty acids. Like it, it's going to push them a little bit. This is not something that um, the super geeks who spend all day on the internet, like they're not going to learn anything super new with it, but it is a soup to nuts program. It's beautifully done. It's got great video. The... Uh, the course workbook alone, which takes you day by day through all of the material is like mm. 168 pages. So, oh, wow. I mean, it's a book within the whole thing. So we put a ton of effort into that. So what I'm hoping is that, yeah, we'll have to do some of the clickbaity stuff, but then what we give people is actually really, really good. Yeah. And and then, you know, we kind find of a bait a, and switch type of a little bit of a bait and switch. It's kind of like, okay, yeah, this looks like bullshit. Oh, wow. It's actually it's something actually reasonably stuff. legit, yeah, you, know? you know, and that yeah. that's the, the hope. And we've shown it to like the guys at Keto Gains and they were like, wow, this is really, really good. You know, it, it, it's engaging. It looks good. It has good polish and all that. And then the material is on point. And one element of the material is even though it's a it's recommending a ketogenic diet, we have a, a kind of a self-selection process where maybe a ketogenic diet isn't the way you should go. Maybe it's just kind of moderate carb. And so we actually have a way for people, even though this is the keto masterclass, we're not selling it as religious dogma that this is mm. the one and only way to go th uh, go about this. If you're a CrossFit Games competitor, if you're into jujitsu, if you have some uh, adrenal fatigue or HPTA axis dysregulation or what have you, ketogenic diet might not be the way that you want to do it, like a moderate carb approach. And, and we give people a completely stepwise fashion to figure all that stuff out. 
So the hope there is that, yeah, we're going to lean on some of these clearly successful marketing tools mm. and then hopefully deriv- deliver something that's not total dog shit. You but said something I have a question about. So uh, uh, you talked about HPA dysregulation in keto. Why wouldn't that be a good, necessarily a good option for people in that in that particular state? Well, and it's funny. It could be a great option or it could be a disastrous option. Okay, so, yeah. Let's- uh, uh, so if you have somebody who is experiencing um, now HPA dysregulation, what is that first off? To hypothalamus, audience? pituitary, adrenal, and then you can also throw in thyroid. HPTA. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, thyroid I want to hear also. what he has to say about Moda. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, you you have some people that uh, become insulin resistant for a variety of reasons. It can be sleep. <clears> it can be gut dysbiosis. It, it can be and, and generally overeating is a big piece of this. It doesn't necessarily just need to be carbs, although carbs definitely facilitate the process. Um, I'm not in the camp that carbs are the cause of like insulin resistance and, and uh, uh, diabetes and all that. I think that they're definitely a contributor. I'm not specifically in that like kind of Gary Tobbs camp that says right. carbs are, are insulin resistance. I have been there, but over the course of time, I've, I've kind of changed positions on that. But if somebody gets into a spot for whatever, you know, however the fuck they get there and they're in high blood sugar, low blood sugar, high blood sugar, low blood sugar, that cyclic element of the, the blood sugar dysregulation is super stressful. The brain does not like these peaks and troughs in blood sugar. So we get the adrenals pinged to release cortisol and adrenaline to bring the blood sugar back up on the, the backside. That antagonizes thyroid production. The cortisol release directly antagonizes the conversion of T4 into T3. It accelerates conversion of T3 into reverse T3. So you just kind of cock block all of the the (laughs) thyroid production. It's literally the body trying to balance out while it's going up and down. And over time, this can cause like receptors to downregulate and the body to become more resistant to even things like cortisol? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you have one group of people that is in a uh, a situation where they're they're getting that cyclic hypoglycemic kind of event, and a low carb or ketogenic diet may be the ticket for those people. But you have other folks that maybe the the HPTA axis dysregulation, whether it's thyroid specifically or um, some people with uh, autoimmune disease. Guy, you guys need to get on the the your podcast, Brian Walsh. He's a naturopath. Okay. That name so and, right. uh, I, I like had him down. I had him on my show, and I thought I knew my my immunology and like my my. Uh, oh wow, he dropped some knowledge on you then. Oh dude, he. Oh, he wow. oh, I had some immunologists ping me, who were like. For a non-immunologist, that guy knows his immunology. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Like, and how's yeah. his conversation? Is it like yours? F- phenomenal. Oh, phenomenal. wow. Okay. He's, he's, he's an educator through and through. But he really got in and started talking about like, okay, so if we do something like a Dutch test and we look at, you know, total uh, cortisol and cortisol metabolites, maybe the reason why the cortisol is low is because the body is trying to turn on or off different segments of the immune system for a therapeutic effect. So- your cortisol looks low and the kind of standard like a uh, uh, three or four point um, uh, adrenal stress index test. It's kind of like, okay, usually that somebody would see that. They would see an, uh, an overall low cortisol status and then they would recommend something like licorice, which uh, licorice extracts uh, enhance the retention of cortisol in our system. It blocks the breakdown of, of cortisol in the liver. So we may get an elevated cortisol level but that may be antagonistic to what the body actually right. needs you to do because it's actually trying to either wow. suppress or enhance one element. To, and so this is where you're, you're basically doing green allopathy. You see something that you assume on this specific little slice of the story is a problem. So you treat the symptom and then you end up making the overall problem worse. Now, are there yeah. signals that you mm-hmm. see like when people are trying to figure this out when like they say we're, we're trying to figure this out for me and I notice stuff going on with my body that I can tell you about like the average person that's playing with going in or out of keto is there are there signs that that this could be you uh, sleep dysregulation performance decrease i mean it, it's kind of the standard deal Listen that I, to I your body how you do you look how do you feel how do you perform we could look at some basic biomarker you know kind of considerations but that's where i just um i try we try to sort people it's kind of like dropping a marble down this mm-hmm. thing and it, so we try to sort people create a logic tree so that they can get themselves to a spot where they can then test and then based off the testing, we can then drive the boat like, okay, yeah, man, keto's working great for you or no, nah, it's not. Let's bump the carbs up to 75 grams a day and see how you do. And so we have a really uh, 
transparent process with that to help people figure out what's what's best for them. So in that mm-hmm. state, why would keto be bad then? You were going down that path of the... For some people, and in, in particularly in the beginning of this, this process, we do see an enhanced adrenal output. We tend to see elevated cortisol, elevated adrenaline, uh, corticosteroids uh, across the the border elevated. And if somebody's already in kind of a compromised state, Got it. it might be too much. It is definitely a stress, particularly when you first enter into the the ketogenic state. So if they're already like teetering on the brink, it may not be the, the I noticed this with fasting them. with clients of mine. Uh, yep. In particular, I noticed it with myself. If I, When I fast, sometimes the energy I get feels very uh, sympathetic in nature. It yep. feels like it's cortisol driven. Yep. And I can tell the difference between normal good energy and that kind of wired, dare I say, addictive type of energy right. that I tend to get. And so that's when I'll start to modify how often I fast. Because I know right. if I push that too hard, I could enter into that state. I've uh, I've also speculated potential behavioral changes in people um, where perhaps they're seeking out uh, activities um, uh, that cause cortisol to spike because they need more. For example, right. I'll notice people like this who are in this HPA you know, kind of dysfunction uh, will seek out the harder workouts because they feel so good while they're doing them, even though it's the exact opposite of what they need, um, it, perhaps because those harder workouts are causing that spike of cortisol now they feel good. Um, are, are, you, are there other behavioral effects that you can kind of connect to you know, some of these things. Yeah. And I mean, this gets really soft science and, and a little though. bit woo. Yeah. You're, a, <laughs> um, you're a fun person to speculate I, with. That's I, why I just, we're here. Um, we did last I, time. I see people just like dysfunctional relationships. Hmm. So like they cause those cortisol spots. They can't deal with just like, hey, I'll, you know, like my wife and I, 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 I give her shit all the time, but she is super even keel. We have a really amazing handoff deal. Like, um, I, in working on this, this keto masterclass, when I was doing the primary content generation, she did the bulk of like the cooking, the house, all that type of stuff. I finished that. And now she is the one that's basically tasked with getting all this like click funnel integration, all this type of stuff. And so like the past two, three weeks, like I take the kids to school, pick them up. I do 99% of the cooking. So we have a really easy transition with that. And we have, there's no drama. Like we, we were just talking about it. We're like, neither one of us ever hang the other one out to dry because right. it's like, oh fuck, I've been taking care of the kids for three weeks straight. Right. It's like, well, yeah, because Nikki, you're doing all the important stuff now and I don't have anything important to do. There are people that, and I think some of it is, is maturity also, but I think that there's something where like either low dopamine or maybe this need for that kind of adrenalized state, mm. they just create drama oh, because wow. you feel more alive in the moment and then you get all the makeup sex and all that type of stuff <laughs> afterwards too. But you know, they they can't deal with even keel. Even keel freaks them out. It's almost like wow. there's no, it, it's almost like a, a sensory deprivation chamber mm-hmm. in a way where they don't get any feedback. And, and so they need to, to start, it, it's like a bat, you know, it's pinging out sonar wow. to try to get something see, coming back. I, I don't see, hmm. when people say that's kind of soft science or woo-woo, I, I counter and say, we've known for a long time that changes in hormones and you know neurochemicals definitely can affect behavior. They can definitely change behavior. Right. You give testosterone to a woman or you give a man estrogen or whatever in extreme cases, you will see changes in behavior. It only makes sense that if the body is seeking out or needs cortisol, that it will alter behavior in ways that will cause more cortisol to release. So things that I've noticed with clients is these people that I've identified in this particular, you know, uh, in this category of people, They'll be late for appointments often. They'll have mm-hmm. deadlines, and they'll wait to the last minute to get them going. And or things will be going rush. good, and they'll purposely sabotage themselves. And it's right? because they—it's yeah. almost like their body's driving them to 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 do these types of things. And then when we work on—and it's funny because it's this cyclical type of thing because it feeds it. So then I'll tell them we need stress management. And then that, and that'll also feed into getting their bodies more responsive to cortisol and all that other stuff. Now, is this so, something though that could potentially be something that's more behavioral that they've been that they've been embedded with since they were children because of that? Because they grew up in a chaotic house and stress was always there, so they were. See, for me, being the reductionist, like biochemist guy, where I'm like the 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 neurophysiology, the biochemistry, and the behavior to me are inseparable, oh, you know? God so, damn, and, I'm so and, happy you said well, that. And, and there's a bunch, but this, then there's a bunch of people that are like, where's the spirit and everything? And I'm like, I don't know, man, I'm still waiting for my <laughs> burning bush. So, so I don't know. And, and when, it, when I said that I, uh, you know, this stuff is soft science, there's this whole 
little corner of the internet where if you don't have an RCT for something, then it it, it just doesn't fucking exist. And, you know, all of those people, I really those want the, to... Our favorite ones to poke the, at, right? I, yeah. I want to bring them to the, the hammer meter where we stick their foot in this thing and it's like, you drop a hammer on their foot and it's like, did it hurt? And they're all, yeah. And I'm like, ah, there's not a fucking RCT for it. <laughs> you know, it didn't hurt, you know. We, there's no proof that it hurt. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's interesting because um, just through our process, through fitness, we've all been doing this for so long. You start to get to this point where you realize that in in op- in a state of optimal health, um, that your body kind of the, the signal the signals that it it tells you to eat, sleep, and the way you should behave and whatever it all you just kind of listen to your body and it kind of tells you what to do. But then when you throw them off with you know poor diet or you know constant exposure to you know electric lights or whatever, it throws everything off to the point where it affects your entire life, not just the stuff that we normally can measure like body fat or right. performance and that kind of stuff. So it's you know, very, very fascinating. I, I know when we deal with these people, I know I have a few series of things that I tend to go to. Do you have like a go-to advice that you kind of start? Because someone who seeks that all the time, it's kind of like, okay, let's address food, sleep. Do you have an order of operation that you tend to go to when helping somebody? Like- oh, man. So when we ran the gym, I was just so- – I was going to say I was such a dick, but it, it, <laughs> what I had a really short window of opportunity for people to get on board because we had, it, there was a point where I had like 48,000 unread emails in my, my inbox, um, and I don't have that now because now my, my uh, uh, assistant deals with it, you know, and he, he kind of sorts and triages, but we would open these emails, and there were people that were like dying, and they're like, I just... I need help with autoimmunity and I live in Illinois. Is there anyone that can help me? And so like there was all this latent need and people that would kill for any help. And then I had this person come in front of me that that was uh, exhibiting or experiencing these kind of squirrely behaviors because of dopamine or whatever the fuck it was. And so I had a really brisk, direct intervention with them. It's like, hey, there's 100 people behind you you're going to do X, Y, Z and you're going to trust in the process and you're not going to ask questions because there's somebody else that wants it more than you and they may not be the pain in the ass and I'd rather succeed than, than fail, you Mm -hmm. know? And so, but I mean, it's the standard stuff, you know, sleep, appropriate movement, and then also trying to get people in their body. And this is something that you kind of alluded to. If somebody was raised in a super chaotic environment, and I would kind of put that with myself. I love my parents. They were great people. My dad had, Someday I want to do a book about both my parents' lives. You, you as lost kids. them at what, what yeah, age, right? They, uh, they, not super early, but uh, my dad eleven years ago, my mom like four, four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. But um, they had super abusive, challenging <coughs> lives, and so what they were able to do with me was a quantum leap better than the lives that they experienced. But it was still like crazy. Like my mm-hmm. uh, looking back now and talking to my. Sisters sometimes, like my mom was probably bipolar, like she had all kinds of uh, problems going on, but did a really amazing job for what she did. But coming out of that chaotic environment, I sought chaos. And so a lot of my early relationships, like the more dysfunctional and broken the person was, like, man, I've got <laughs> exactly, here's your gears, and man, my gears mesh, perfect wow. dysfunction. Oh, I got your I got your solution. And it took a long time to be able to disengage from that and actually- it took me 28 years. How long did it take you? Do you remember? Possibly a little longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> You're smarter than I am. So, you know, and, and, but, and I talked, talk to my wife about this. This is part of the reason why I do jujitsu, part of the reason why I do bow hunting and stuff like that. I've got to have that other thing that is the danger and the risk Mm. and the dopamine and the engagement. Otherwise it's like, oh wow, here's a dysfunctional person. And you know, all of those tendencies are still there. So I I would try to have that conversation with, with folks, but I'm not a therapist, but you know, just some of this kind of big picture stuff of it, it's really interesting getting people to start functioning in a way that's healthy. So if they had a gambling habit or if they spent money that they don't have, like there's all this kind of dopamine, like, you know, living in the moment kind of deal. And if you get people to not do that, they'll, they'll look at you and they're like, dude, this is like eating cardboard. It's kind of like the hypo palatable food mm-hmm. problem. Their life just sucks. They don't have any joy. They don't have any excitement. And you have to figure out ways of getting it from other places. And this is why you look into the uh, CrossFit world, there are a ton of people that were addicts of various flavors. Oh, geez. Mm. Yeah. Dude, CrossFit. And I still can't figure out how more of these 
formerly addicts become CrossFitters are not also vegan wow. because that just seems like the fucking <laughs> the the trifecta, yeah. you know? And, 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 and I just, Let's perhaps the it. training volume actually kicks them out of that. Like it would destroy them if they did it. But, you know, you find things like that where hopefully it's a more, um, it, it's a healthier obsession, but there's still that need for, for the, you know, and Art, Art Devaney, I know I'm bouncing all over the place, but Art Devaney has talked about this a lot from like the evolutionary perspective. We just had a certain amount of chaos and danger baked in the cake living as hunter gatherers. And there's some expectation for that. And life becomes so monotonous and, and predictable that then people start doing squirrely things. This is our, like, this is our yeah. theory on like the huge rise of like OCR and, right. and these events where we punish ourselves for 16, 19 miles an obstacle because we're becoming so plugged in yeah. that we need to feel again. We need to feel ourselves right. and feel alive. And so I think a lot of these businesses are going to continue to explode because tech is just moving so fast and we're becoming more. I mean, we got VR around the corner. Right. Real soon here, we're going to see people that probably have a challenge of stepping out of VR because VR is better than their actual right. reality. It's so, it's so right. funny you said what you said because a lot of our issues early on with uh, some of the movements of CrossFit and then OCR and marathons is because when we were trainers, the clients that would seek those out were the last people that should probably be doing them. Right. They would treat them like another addiction like right. like you know like they're moving from one to another and just continue to pound their body because they're seeking that you know that and and so a lot of our job was to try to you know okay well that's one step now let's get you to another step it's almost like you got to take a person through steps of obsession that are gradually better and better and better kind of get them wean them off almost right um it's uh this whole desensitizing process i think is what you're talking about where people will stop and then just be like Life sucks, right? And it's it's all it's no different than for me at least than when I work with a client and I start to change their nutrition and they're finding the food that they're eating just boring, right? You know, it doesn't like water. I, this one always used to blow me away, but I would tell people like, all you're going to drink is water. Let's start with that from now. For, you know, oh, in, in the beginning, it's like punishing and, them. And the way yeah. like, I can't drink water, it doesn't taste good. And, I, and to me, it was just mind blowing. Like it's fucking water. What do you mean? Is it and you want to lock them in a closet for like four days, and then you're like, "This is gonna be the best thing you ever drank." Yeah, right. <laughs> Perspective. And you, and you scoop it out of a tepid toilet, you know, and you're like, "There you go." And they're like, "Ah." Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, so, yeah. but I do think, you know, uh, just talking about this, it's um, it's it's as if we've been taught to ig ignore our body signals since we were children. Everything from hunger to which you know, which most of us never experienced real hunger, to ignoring our systems of satiety to then uh you know hijacking our systems of you know what is it called pal uh when you when something you get sick of eating something pal uh, the palate fatigue palate yeah. fatigue and we're you know and it's almost like we don't even we're so disconnected from our bodies that it just turns into this total mess and it's like and you're talking about the psychological piece uh i see the future of health and wellness being like you need to know all of that because it's such a big role in, in you know in what we're doing yeah, and, you know, to a degree, I, I tried to tackle all that in YRD, you know, sleep and circadian rhythm, food, movement, and then community. And community has this whole, it goes from the gut microbiome to the people around us. And that's also, though, where stress, like most of the things that we experience as stress live, like the keeping up with the Joneses deal and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, all of that, that uh, so much of what we perceive to be stress is just this activity going on between our ears of something that happened in the past or that we're worried about potentially happening in the future. And it's very, very rare that it's actually something like right in front of us, you know, like the car barreling right. towards us or something. It's like, okay, that's a legitimate stress. We need to address <laughs> that. And everything else is is just something that we're bringing on ourselves. And uh, the, the book, uh, The Myth of Stress, like I fought that guy on that. I had him on my podcast and, oh. and uh, I was like, Oh, you know, hunter gatherer times, like we had less stress and everything. He's like, no, 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 that's bullshit. Like, but it, it, it was people were more in the moment and we didn't have this past future orientation. Mm. And uh, he pretty well like beat me down with oh, that. Wow. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, you're actually <laughs> totally right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so, wrong. along those lines, as a father, what are the things that you're scared about in the future, or I don't know if scared is the right word, but what concern, concerned, yeah, what concerns know. you about your, your children's future and what are you excited for? So what do you, what do you, what do you think about? Oh man. Um, that's a big, let me noodle on that a little bit. You, one thing I've been doing with both girls is when they get upset, we do a breathing exercise. Oh, cool. So I'm like, okay, okay, you're okay. Whether they, they're, uh, they get 
psychologically or, or physically hurt, you know, they crash her bike, whatever. And I, I'm like, okay, let's put our hands on her belly and we're going to do our breathing. Wait. Hold it, hold it. And we have a contest to see who can, you know, go the longest on the way out. And I tell you, like, uh, my youngest, uh, Sagan, who's three, dude, she crashed her bike in the most epic way. And luckily it, it was chilly in the morning. So she had on gloves she had on a, a sweat sweatsuit and everything, but I mean, it was like tumble. She had on her helmet and everything, but it was like a dust cloud. Yard and sale. Yeah, it was a goodie. <laughs> and I, I went up there and she's crying completely reasonable, but I like propped her on my leg. I'm like, you okay? Everything good? I'm like, let's do our breathing. It'll make you feel better. She's like, okay, dad, let's do it. And, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> and by the third breath, she was even keel. That's cool. And, uh, I, you know, if I had had that technique as a kid and could have carried that through my adult life, that would have been pretty powerful. Now, usually I still need to coach them on it. Like they don't just like auto regulate with that. But one thing I'm trying to teach them is just this very basic, like kind of biofeedback thing. So yeah. that, um, they're, if they're ever in a situation, if they can get the wherewithal, they can bring themselves back down to a, a really calm state. So how do you, that, how yeah. do you handle tech right now? They, they watch a little bit of TV, maybe uh, twice a week. It's mainly PBS. I, I, I am chagrined to admit. Um, my, and it's so funny. It's almost like, you know, the kids are, are attracted to junk food. Like I, Zoe has figured out how to uh, navigate the Apple TV. And I went in there the other day and it was like um, Barbie and Friends Mermaid Adventures. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? You know, <laughs> I watched it for a few minutes and I'm like, no, we're not watching this. It was just ridiculous. It was just conflict for the sake of conflict like uh. there was nothing even just like the dialogue and stuff was terrible now i will say um she has roped me into watching some my little pony stuff and it's it's illustrated in kind of a uh uh, uh a japanese anime kind of deal and there's some funny stuff in there and so i'm kind of like okay yeah you can watch a little bit of that but it's usually a little more uh there's some intelligent humor in there curious george wild Kratz, and then you know we will um jump onto youtube and we'll pull up like both kids are fascinated by planets and dinosaurs and so like i'll pull up the uh the carl sagan series and so we'll watch some stuff on planets and stuff like that but um they really don't get any iphone access any ipad access um if we travel then we have two iPads that we pull out and they get to watch some movies on the iPad because when we're in hour eight or 10 on the airplane going somewhere, I'm kind of like, okay, we'll, 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 we'll deal it's with whatever, time. you know, yeah. uh, uh, ramifications are. And it's like cocaine for them. Yes. They want it mm -hmm. desperately. And it's interesting. We bought uh, both girls a little camera <laughs> last Christmas, maybe the Christmas before. And it has a lot of games on it and everything, but it's a set number of options, whereas these iPhones and iPads are effectively infinite. There's always something you can tweak download or and fiddle or... and download. And, you know. and so it's interesting. They will go through cycles where they'll play with the camera and they take pictures and they do the kind of like uh, uh, low-grade uh, uh, photo editing with it and stuff like that. And there's a few games that they play on it and they enjoy it. But then they put it down, they may not play with it for three weeks. Whereas, like, if there's any of that iPhone, iPad interaction, it's like cocaine. They, it's they, interesting. Oh, I notice, yeah. like, mm -hmm. literal, um, I mean, classic withdrawal symptoms from my kids because they'll mm -hmm. go to my their, their grandma's house and sometimes she's busy or whatever. So they'll get on these iPads and they'll be on them for, I mean, if I, no joke, I, I'm fully confident. And if I left them alone with an iPad, they would stay on there from morning till night. No right, problem. Yeah. No yeah, problem. If you don't monitor them at Possibly all. Possibly until they starve to death. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But yeah. I'll take it away if they've been on there for three hours. You know, I'll come home and be like, no, I'm taking that away. And there's these classic withdrawal symptoms. And then they're... It's just like food. It's, the, if, the great, Probably one of the best books I've read this year was a book called Irresistible. And they mm. talk about... Uh, the addiction and how all of these guys who created all these apps and was they wouldn't was, let their kids go near they them. don't no. yeah they don't that, to me that just fascinates me that here you are as a father who's creating this incredible thing this is what probably provides the food for your children but they're not allowed to use that right. tool because I know how much R and D I put into making sure making that, it addictive yeah making yeah. it addictive mm -hmm. that's a scary thought and then you see and I don't know how far you think because I know they're younger. But like you see with Instagram and Facebook and even now companies, when they go to hire somebody, 
they ask for social media. Right. Because as a business owner now, if I've got all three of you coming to work for me and you guys are all trainers and, uh, you know, Justin's got 3,000, Sal's got 2,000, you got 20,000 people connect to you on Instagram. Well, I don't even really care if these guys are maybe a little bit smarter than you. I know you're, you're going to pull more for my business. So, right. I mean, now it has that much power and influence. So, as a parent, like, how do you wrap your brain around, like, how do I introduce this to them? How do I let them use this? But then also not discourage it's them too much. It's such a new because, frontier, man. Yeah. I could potentially hurt yeah. them in the future for work and business. Like You know, it, it's interesting. So, both girls go to a Montessori school, oh, which, which is super cool. And the way that they handle tech, they they... they they don't want any screen time. Like even the amount of TV that, that we provide the kids, they're probably like, ah, it's you know too much. But um, one point that they make is that technology advances so quickly that the UI, the user interface, is, it gets simpler and simpler and simpler. There's no point in like having the kids go over and you know like type stuff into a keyboard or even like playing around with that quite yet because the user interface when they get into like a work environment is probably going to be different. So that's a great point. Why even bother with mm. this stuff? And so that that's kind of interesting. And um, mm. but when you go into their library, they definitely do have some nice computers in there for kids to do research and stuff like that. One of the things that caught me the the most when I walked in there is at the the top shelf of uh one of their main bookshelves was like uh, 20 years of The Economist magazine. And I'm like, oh, we're, oh, fu- there you we're go. fucking here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, if we're they're there. teaching kids that now, that's well, excellent. And they have Which some, they should. They have some cool stuff where like all of the classes um, help to prepare the hot lunch. And then they start, as the kids get into the primary education, they learn about profit and loss and what they're charging. And oh, no way. okay, to make this thing, oh, macaroni brilliant. and cheese, uh, it costs this much money and we need to charge this much to be able to deal with, Brilliant. you know, and it, it, stuff like that is, is, is real, you know? It, it, so it, yes, what, what, uh, you know, maybe I'll try to avoid the scary stuff, but one of the things that did just pop into my head, uh, the opportunity here, if you have an interest in something in this day and age, like they would need to lock you in a room to prevent you from learning about right. it and potentially becoming a world expert on it. Right. Now, if you want to learn welding or knife making or, or you know, how to do cardiothoracic surgery or something like that, you need to go as effectively intern with that. But you can learn a massive amount about so many different things. You could learn languages, you know, oh, yeah. all of the, the uh, uh, what is it, Khan Academy and all that stuff. Like literally the potentially the be- – if you want to learn economics, you could learn from someone who's not only brilliant in it, but brilliant in communicating right. it. Mm-hmm. Versus like you hit the community college and it's kind of a mixed bag. Maybe they're it's good, like maybe they're that's not. How, <laughs> yeah. That's how I started, man. I was on YouTube and I, I saw Milton Friedman, which he's like the, one of the greatest communicators of, uh, of economics that you can find. And that just took me down a rabbit hole and I became very passionate about it. But had I gone to... A university and listen to some boring, you know, instructor. I remember my econ class in high school, so I could. I was like, "This is this sucks." Right. Then you hear Milton Friedman. I'm like, "Whoa, this is great!" You know, right. It's like a- right. exciting times. Definitely exciting so, times. So you have an opportunity like that, you know, and and uh, uh, our our youngest is really interesting. And in at, at three, she uh, and you know, this is the doting dad to some degree, but even other people are kind of like, "Okay, she really understands math well." Like she'll. She's like, Dad, I'm I'm this many, and Zoe is this many, and you're mm-hmm. you're four plus, you know, five, you know, for forty five and all this stuff. And I'm kind of like, holy shit! And we we just bought a puzzle the other day, this dinosaur puzzle, and the kid just like scans the pile of pieces, grabs it, plugs it in, and like it would take me thirty minutes to find that thing, and I would have to sort each one. I'm looking at the colors, That's great. so she's got mm-hmm. some pattern recognition stuff early, and and uh, so I'm like, maybe some math, maybe some engineering, who knows? And then Zoe has a whole, you know, a uh, uh, set of stuff that she's really That's interested awesome. in. So it's really that part is really exciting, yeah. in that we could use some technology to be able to, you know, anything they're passionate about, anything they wanted to do. If one of them wanted to do art. You could learn so much about art online, and then if they right. really wanted to go intern with somebody, it's like, okay, there's this dude in Florence, Italy, and instead of sending you to university to get a fucking slapdick art degree, we'll send you to Florence. <laughs> you need to study and learn Italian, and you're going to intern with this guy for one to two years, and so long as you stay on course, I'll pay for that. You know, That's and so cool. So those are and it'll huge cost the same amount. <laughs> right, it would probably cost the same amount, but the connections oh, yeah, and the the you, you know like oh, the yeah yeah. yeah. 
Are you familiar yeah. with the company uh, Creative Live? Have you yes. seen yeah, yeah. stuff I, like I, that? I know those folks. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, that's great excellent. stuff for sure. That's, yeah. that's, so so on, along these lines with nutrition, obviously this is an area of expertise for you. How do you feed your kids and how do you recommend people feed their kids? Because I know obviously we, we've, we talk about different ways of eating. Some of them are more restrictive than others like keto. But when you feed children, uh, what is the best approach to, to – you know? Making sure that they're healthy. Or is there a best approach? I, I would be super reticent to saying there's a best approach. Like I, I would be really uh, remiss in in saying that. Um, I'm glad in a way that we had kids later as opposed to earlier in my whole paleo process because I could have probably been a lunatic um, earlier on. But it, it, it's tough. So what did they have for breakfast this morning? They had some uh, organic patty sausage that we got from Whole Foods. They had strawberries. They had this uh, nutty hot cereal. So I take apples and almonds, blend them up in a blender, puree them, super, super fine, basically like oatmeal kind of consistency, cook it on the stovetop, and it, oh, it's just like hot cereal. Mm -hmm. And I put a little cinnamon in it, and the girls crush it. So they had sausage, uh, strawberries, nutty hot cereal, and then some pecans. And that's what they had. Yesterday, they had some sausage, and they had some gluten-free French toast that I made on the weekends. We kind of loosen stuff up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what, after after they had French toast that, that morning, all the way through the evening, first thing this morning, they're like, Dad, can we have French toast? You know? <laughs> and and, uh, and usually Friday nights, mm -hmm. we do gluten-free pizza night. And they, they um, part of it is, is they really enjoy it. And part of it is by Friday, my wife and I are smoked and it's the one meal that we stick in front of them. And they're like a pack of hyenas they just eat it down to the nubs and they lick the plate and we don't have to do a fucking thing. <laughs> We're not like, hey, eat that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and they don't drop it on the floor. Like if they do, they're down there like licking it off the, the floor. So, there, so there's, this is, you know, so you ask about what's optimum. Part of the optimum of that is we get one meal where my wife and I can like have a glass of wine and we're and we, relax. we can just talk because yeah. the kids oh, wow. they're like dad have more pizza and you're like boom yeah. there you go done. <laughs> Whereas like even though they will eat well generally, but I have to be like hey girls come on get after this yeah. you know and there's a little bit of that. But generally it's meat, fruit, veggies. It kind of rotates seasonally. Um, the girls love soup, so I, I make soup a lot and it's just like carrots and broccoli. It's, and, it's a and, tough. You know, uh, it's tough with children because on the one hand you know you want to you, you you definitely dictate what they eat and you regulate it, but on the other hand you don't want to create these bad relationships with right. food where you're right. finish this or you can't eat that or you know you reward them with food. I, and I do do some speed bump stuff where they're like, uh, oh man, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Even just like uh, uh, blueberries or something like that. I want some more blueberries. I'm like, okay, finish your meat and you can have some more blueberries. So. Mm -hmm. I do a little bit of a speed bump method mm -hmm. where they, they have to do stuff like that. Um, Zoe asked me, she's like, well, Dada, why can't we just have pizza and French toast all the time? I'm like, that is a really good question. I was like, some people do pretty much do that. And for some people, they can be healthy. And for a lot of other people, it makes them unhealthy. They get sick. Their tummy hurts. They maybe gain too much weight. Um, you, she's... Uh, she has a friend whose father had a heart attack and we talked to her a little bit about some of this food can cause problems with your heart and everything. So we're not trying to do scare tactics, but we're also trying to say, you know, generally we eat well and then that way it allows us to eat this other. And I try not to even call it treats and stuff like that because I don't want any emotional attachment to it. You it's know, I'm like sometimes one. we have this stuff and sometimes we don't, we just don't, you, you know, and, and, uh, interestingly, I think both girls, and, and so this also dictates a little bit of what we do. Both girls seem to be pretty damn insulin sensitive, which their mother is very insulin sensitive. So I think that they kind of pull from that. Cause even if we do like the French toast deal, the girls, it, we don't get like a, a blood sugar crash two hours later where they're like just melting down and going crazy. Some of that may be because they always get some fat and protein with it. Some of it may be because they're active and, and they're just generally insulin sensitive. But I haven't noticed um, there's a little bit of dairy issues. So we tend to give them goat and sheep dairy instead of cow dairy. They'll get some cow dairy mm. if we're out eating or something like that. I don't, I don't sweat that, but we don't do that a huge amount. Um, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've done this where I'll, I'll, uh, uh, the strategy that I've developed with my kids, and it seems to work really well, is I'll just serve them, 
in the order of importance with the food. So, right. And I right. don't bring all the food out right. at the same time because yep. that really yep. fucks things up. Yeah. So I'll literally be like, all right, and boom, here's your vegetables. Yeah, and then I'll just go crazy. I'll be like, what are we having for dinner? I'm like, vegetables. And then they'll eat their vegetables. And then, okay, here's your meat. And then they'll right. eat their meat. And then if they're not hungry anymore, then there's no need to continue progressing, you know, because they've eaten the important stuff. So now if they're like, right. I don't want to eat anymore, then it's like, okay, well, then we're, we're done eating. And they right. eat the rest of it. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up doing the whole don't eat that, you have to eat that right. type of thing. So so I want to I circle back, Rob, to something you mentioned about uh, your childhood. I um, I grew up in a challenging uh, household myself. My mom also had a crazy childhood, and I probably talk about the same way you do, where I think she did the best that she could right. and much better than what she w- probably went through. But nonetheless, uh, my father took his life when I was seven. My mom remarried into an abusive relationship, So, and, and I'm the oldest of five kids. So a lot of that definitely formed me into the man that I am today. Some things, awesome, and that I'm happy and I'm and I'm grateful for those characteristics. Some of the other ones have taken a long time to grow through. What are the things that you notice about yourself from being brought up like that that are that have made you uh, the man you are today, as far as your strengths Mm. and then the ones that you still battle? Man, that's a really good question. You know, it's funny because you opened with like doing the the business stuff and the click funnels and all that. Being raised in a poor now poor is relative this is poor in a first world country white blah right. blah blah sure. my privilege stuff i have like, to explain whatever, to people yeah. like <laughs> i know what food stamps look like yeah it, I've, we, I've been evicted from stamps, a house so. yeah 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 you know the, but i had the, a roof over my the, head the brick of uh, government issue cheese i i really look forward to it so comparatively we we were pretty poor um what i got phenomenally good with coming out of that environment was like, you could dump me anywhere and I would figure out something reasonably cool with that situation. Like I could make do with whatever I was thrown into. Drop me off in Siberia and I'll have a still and, and <laughs> it, you know, growing potatoes or, or whatever. And it was interesting. Um, I was in a grad program and interestingly, as part of this, this science-based grad program, they had an art elective. And I'm like, oh, I'll take this art elective. And uh, the gal told us to envision something that we wanted to make and then make it. And there were like Legos and Erector sets and all this different stuff. And I just started kind of throwing shit together. And she came by and she's like, so Rob, what do you, what do you make? I'm like, I don't know. This thing's kind of cool and this and that. And she's like, well, the the exercise is to envision something and then make it. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I know. I'm, and I wasn't doing it. And she kept needling me and needling me. And dude, I got fucking pissed. Like, <sighs> like, you know, melt down, stomp out of there. Like she got in my kitchen and I didn't even realize until later the frustration that I had is I was incapable of envisioning something. I was completely cock blocked on that. I couldn't envision anything I wanted to do. Now I could make do with what I had in front of me, but I was incapable of being able to envision something. Maybe five years fast forward and I'm in a relationship with with Nikki, my, my wife, and she's talking to me about this stuff because these things pop up in the course of like business and whatnot. Like I became really good at making do, but I was abysmal at being able to envision something and then go for it. And part of what it, uh, I believe an outgrowth of that is that in this chaotic environment, you can't really plan down the road. Mm. And so you become good at just dealing with the the here and the now. And that's a very laudable thing that, that's powerful, but an inability to plan and to dream and to, to, to chase that stuff. And part of it too, is you already deal with so much letdown that if you envision getting something and then you work towards it and you fail, that might be enough to just fucking kill you mm-hmm. like right where you're at. So the thing that I'm really like just kind of birthing into is being able to say, Hey, I want to do this. I want to do that. You know, like I, I finally, a couple of years ago, I'm like, I'm going to get my fucking black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I may be 70 when I get it, but I'm, I'm going to do it, you know, and I'm, I'm ticking that stuff through. And then we had some, some ideas around, like, uh, we, we had a beautiful house in kind of a, a suburban kind of setting. I'm like, I hate this. The homeowners associations, our neighbors, I fucking hate them. I hate all of it. I want to be on a little farm. I want to be able to shoot my bows and arrows. I want to do this, that, and the other. Zoe or Nikki was like, well, envision it. And I drew some stuff out and we went and got it and we knocked it out. But I'm, I'm probably at like a, eight or nine year olds level of being able to like envision something and then go out and, and knock it out and do it. But that's, um, it's been a hugely powerful thing for me. And, and it was something that I, I, uh, 
what happened to me it, being able to make do with the situation was really beneficial and it still serves me a lot today like I don't have a lot of like frustrations and, and it, I see people, they show up at a restaurant and they're like, this cheesecake just isn't the way it was last time. And I'm like, well, cry me a fucking river, <laughs> you know? Whereas for me, I'm like, oh, it's a little bit different. That's cool. I'm going to have more of the Brussels sprouts or whatever. Like it just doesn't phase me in that regard. But then also it, it allows me to um, not have the standards that I should have and the mm. things that I do actually want. Like I'll be like, mm. eh okay, that's cool. I'll just make do with this. And there are some times where like, you want to get your fucking back up and be like, no, God damn it. This is what I'm going to do. And as a 45 year old male, I'm just now learning how to do that. But I've been very, very good at making do. And I'm just now learning how to make what I want. And, and it's really interesting. And honestly, God, it's still scary. Yeah. Like it's a, mm -hmm. it, I feel like I'm, I'm high wire walking <laughs> and not real comfortable with, with what I'm doing with it. Cause I've got, years of skill set that's so refined in this other area but that, that is a really good question that, is, that mm -hmm. requires a, a, a such a high level of self-awareness because it was so um, so much a part of who you are like how did you start to even see it and recognize well, it well especially when when and this is like I can totally relate when a majority of your life it it, uh, it helped you get through and oh, you, dude, it, you it were successful because of it success so yeah. th th I, I remember being yeah, in my you could 20s have very easily identified with it and be like this is how I work and I'm already kicking ass and what's the big deal type of this thing. is why I always tell people you know normally your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness right and if you learn to look at it like that because we real easily we look at oh this is this is why I'm having success like you can't tell me otherwise that I shouldn't be doing this or to look into it because this is what got me here so yeah, that's really interesting. And it's actually the opposite of me, which is funny because I think I always wanted to escape where I was at. So I was always envisioning stuff mm. and the future mm. and thinking all mm -hmm. the time. So what I'm incredible at is the visionary piece. I'm horrible at the other part. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah. you're probably frustrated by like every, almost every meal yeah, and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, super okay. analytical. Yeah, so. yeah. Huh. True. Huh. It's interesting. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I'm trying to think, you know, so I think part of the, the uh, self-awareness on this was realizing that I had a, a strong predilection towards super codependent dysfunctional relationships. Mm. And then when that got on my radar, I went, went through some, some therapy and counseling. The woman that I worked with on that was amazing and interesting. And, you know, so like even my career path. I just kind of made do with where I was. I was like, I ended up in a chemistry class and I was good at it. This was another thing that's common from kind of uh, poor or not. Um, it, maybe it's not just poor. Maybe it's just this this make do kind of deal. But, uh, you know, anything that I was good at, I would go for it because you got those easy accolades mm. with it, you know. And so I ended up in this chemistry class and I was good at it. And then I got into organic chemistry and I was really good at that. Like I had that ability to like bend these bond angles and everything and kind of see how shit plugged together. And I, it, so that's largely what determined my career path. And then I was in a physiology class and I was pretty good at that. And the woman was like, dude, you should be a doctor. And I was like, oh, okay. It was basically somebody external to me had to give me some sort of validation. Mm -hmm. And then I would be like, wow, I could be a doctor. And she's like, yeah, you could totally look at what you're doing here. So, like, do, you, okay, so. do you look at jujitsu as like you kind of going out of your comfort zone and challenging yourself? Absolutely. Uh, on, on a lot of which different is probably levels. why it's been great for you. Yeah, because um, one, I have a modicum of success in the world that I've, I've been in. So like I could just say, okay, I'm going to be powerlifting Rob and I could go back into the gym and have some impressive numbers with that and just like stay in that scene and that's fine. And I'm not, not running people down who do that. But part of the jujitsu thing is you are naked every day. Like you- You get your ass exposed, kicked all the time. You get your ass kicked all the fucking time. By guys smaller than you, weaker than you. <laughs> <By> women, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. And, uh, and so there's that element to it. And it, it's also something that I need to sit in and actively- steward my process. It's like, well, what type of game do I want? If I, if I have a completely passive, just let it come to me kind of, kind of approach to jujitsu, I'll never make any progress anywhere. And so it's something that keeps me engaged mm -hmm. and, and forces me to have kind of that vision about where I want to go with it. But you know, the, uh, really becoming aware of the type of relationships that I was good at again. I had great skill set for dysfunctional relationships. And then I was like, I don't want to be in dysfunctional relationships. So I've got to recognize when I'm heading in that direction. And then I've got to develop a set of skills to do something else. And I got have to give my wife huge credit on this stuff. Like it was interacting with her and in, in the process of growing multiple businesses, 
I would ask her a lot of questions. I'm like, so what are you thinking through with this? She's like, well, I'm imagining that we're going to do boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, I can't imagine any of this stuff. Oh, and then um, this is where I told her about the art class and this and that. And so it, it's been kind of a, you know, peeling the layers back of this whole thing. But it, it, it's a... Uh, yeah, I guess that's been kind of the you know, process. I, yeah. I definitely, uh, I used to say I had a sign on a back that, on my back that you said, I'll help you. And I used to totally date those girls, you know, was right. the, the father Cap figure. Captain Bro <laughs> yeah. Broken wing, <laughs> yes. I am your answer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I just love to we fix everybody, guy. right? And it took, like I said, till about 28. Um, now, was Nikki the first woman that wasn't like that for you? Or were there previous relationships where you started to notice that you were starting to put that together? Like, oh, I keep like she's not as messed up as the previous one. Yeah. She's still there was a, there was a little bit of a stepping stone process. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 that's what yeah. I noticed because I'm, I'm Katrina is definitely my rock. I've, she's been with me for six and a half years, but it took about uh, three other women that weren't just really dysfunctional to lead right. up to that before I finally feel like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be with. I'm supposed to be with a partner that actually makes me a, makes me a better man too, right? We, right. And it's supposed to be my equal versus me always helping and teaching and growing. So. Yeah, and you know, I got lucky with Nikki. There's this thing called the Chico State effect because you look at her and you look at me and I'm like, I don't see how that works. And also she's smart and she's, she's not crazy and everything. She's super even keel. But there tend to be five women for every two men at Chico State University. <laughs> oh. So, like, if you're a guy and you have yeah, a pulse awesome. and yeah. you don't have a giant, like, arrest record, you're going to do pretty well. So, so yeah, that would work yeah. out. Yeah. 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 See, we live in San Jose. There's, like, two, yes, three guys. men for yeah. every woman. Yeah, they call right. that Man Jose. Is what Man they call Jose. Man Jose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't do well there. Yeah. Man. It'd be, like, cell block Lots D, right? Like, okay, yeah. Charlie, it's you and me, man. So we like that. Constant fighting. Yeah. Excellent. Well, if we can change gears a little bit and go back to nutrition, because I I love uh, bending your ear on that on that topic. Um, let's talk about the ketogenic diet for a second. Why does a keto type diet seem to work so well for people with autoimmune issues? Because it seems to be, dare I say, one of the better options for people with autoimmune issues, or at least it tends to control or help a lot of them. What is it about it that that is it the is it the fact that they're not eating carbohydrates because it can be inflammatory? Is it the ketones both? You know, so I'll throw a caveat in there. I think that keto has application in some autoimmune contexts, but I think just an autoimmune paleo approach is probably even better. Okay. Um, there's some interesting work by a guy, uh, Walter Longo, doing a fasting mimicking diet, which may be even better, like do the autoimmune paleo foods, go the seven days without eating, reintroduce uh, more or less anti-inflammatory foods. But it, there's clearly, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt, there is a gut permeability issue associated with autoimmune disease. You cannot have autoimmune disease without gut permeability. And now the question becomes, does the autoimmune disease cause the gut permeability or does the gut permeability cause the autoimmune disease? And there may, in fact, be some push-pull element to that. But this this is one of the things that, that happens. One of the um, generally underappreciated elements of uh, HIV turning into AIDS, the, the syndrome recognized as AIDS, is a loss of intestinal barrier function. That's kind of the last fucking straw that, that, that goes. And then that whole immune-driven catabolic, you know, cascade kicks off with that. And this is why I literally want to choke fuckers to death who, uh, you know, do not just at least give this a little airplay. It's like, we have a suggested mechanism related to, you know, behind cancer and, and uh, diabetes-related killers. This autoimmune thing is massive, mm -hmm. and, and the, the treatment for it is piss poor. So uh, the people who just dismiss it out of hand, I literally want to, like, kill them physically with, with my own, own two hands. But, um, but so if we have a gut permeability issue then definitely fermentable carbohydrates can be a problem because we get the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That can lead to some, some problems with, uh, say, like lipopolysaccharide translocating into the, into the circulation and, and causing inflammatory problems, that's liver an issues. That's response right there. That's an immune response right there. Then we just have the immunogenic potential of foods, dairy, nuts, um, tomatoes. This is another thing. There's, there's a couple of popular... Uh, and if I can just clarify, when you when you say that to our audience, what you mean is there are foods 
that just have a higher propensity for an immune yeah. reaction. So, and this is just a fact. There's foods that typically people, if we go extreme and if talk just, about allergy, if you just search, yeah, what are the most allergenic? There foods? you go. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Peanuts, wheat, soy, dairy. You know, and again, it's not to say everybody has that, but those problems, but. A lot of people do, and, and it, it, the autoimmune foods tend to kind of follow in lockstep mm -hmm. with that that list. But you know, so like tomatoes are an interesting thing. A lot of people just dismiss tomatoes and nightshades that they could be problematic in the least, but yet the the uh, the alkaloids and the saponins and, and the constituents that are in tomatoes are oftentimes used as uh, uh, adjuvants in the for vaccines. vaccines. Yeah. And there have been people who do who are renowned for doing research reviews and stuff like that, and have completely shit on the notion that that uh, uh, nightshades could be problematic in any way. And if the person is renowned in research, but yet has completely missed the fact that they're used as an immune stimulating agent in fucking vaccines, <laughs> either suck mm. as a researcher. Or you're a duplicitous cockface who's got some sort of a, another agenda going That's on. Now, <laughs> again, that that doesn't mean that that all autoimmune disease is triggered by nightshades or tomatoes. Sure. Doesn't mean that that uh, you know uh, that it always happens. But we have a proposed mechanism. We have all kinds of other supportive data. Can we at least kick the tires on this thing? And, and at a minimum, if somebody's having a problem, say. Hey, why don't you try this elimination diet? And I'm actually working on a, a review right now. There was just a paper that was a pilot study. So there was no control arm in this, but they used an autoimmune paleo diet for irritable bowel disease, which include ulcerative colitis and, uh, oh man, Crohn's disease. And they had a really remarkable result with it. Now we didn't have a control arm and it was small number of people. And, you, you know, so people get in and start throwing all these hand grenades at it. But the purpose of the study was to show the potential efficacy and, and um, that people would actually adhere to the protocol. And is it worthwhile doing a randomized controlled trial? And the answer is yes. It's compelling. So I'm in yeah. that world, by the way, because I have a family member with Crohn's. And thank God for the internet, uh, you've got a, enough people that can gather together and create enough anecdote to where that can drive some research. Right. But also, if you're a... You know, if you have Crohn's disease today or some other autoimmune disease that, you know, like you were saying, Western medicine has shit treatments for it. It's either hammer your immune system with something or suppress the hell out of it or even give you mild, low doses of chemotherapy, believe it or not, as some of the treatments. <clears throat> so you can go online and see these groups. And my this, this family member found that something called a carbohydrate-specific diet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. seemed to work really well for people with Crohn's. And really, it, it literally is eliminating a lot of these foods that tend to have these immune responses. And he went into almost complete remission with his Crohn's from following this type of a diet. Right. But at the same time, the Western medicine doctors or the traditional ones, they don't even seem to acknowledge that there could be a, a connection between the two uh, at this particular point. It's very, very frustrating. Oh, it's incredibly frustrating. It, it, it's reached a point for me where I, I uh, it's interesting. I ran across some of the lawyers. I think we talked about this a little bit on the, the last show, but the lawyers that were involved with the tobacco litigation, and we kind of put on their radar this idea about like, uh, if you have some sort of dyslipidemia or, or metabolic syndrome, and you're a healthcare provider, and you recommend something other than a low carb diet, you, you should be held legally responsible mm. for the, the deleterious after effects. And they're like, oh, dude, this, we, we could, this would be easier than, than tobacco, you know? And, and uh, in, in the same vein, you know, any of these autoimmune diseases, it, it's reached a point where if you are a gastroenterologist, <laughs> endocrinologist, what, a, what have you, and you are ignorant of the fact that there is some, some therapeutic potential here, because all we're asking people to do is tweak their food. Right. You know, maybe 30, 60 days, see mm -hmm. what happens. Um, about as, as, and I think like the number three killer of Americans is, is medical intervention. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is just shit going wrong. Like yeah, you go to yeah. your doctor for something that should be benign. It's not even abuse. You it's you're doing exactly what they're telling you to yeah, do. Yeah. Yeah. It's a complete it standard wrong. of care. And so we're worried about recommending low carb diets or right. ketogenic diets when like <laughs> going to get a toenail removed and you fucking die from it, yeah. you know? So, no, yeah. it's, 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 to me, it's, um, it's fucking mind blowing that we don't consider food, uh, to be one of the most important factors in how you feel period. I don't care what your disease or disorder is. I really don't. Food is going to play some kind of a role. Maybe that doesn't cause it. Maybe it doesn't cure it. 
but it can definitely have an impact. I mean, you're, you're taking food and you're putting it in your mouth and it becomes a part of your body and you're doing this every single day and it can affect everything from your skin to your stool to your mood and it's just crazy that they don't even consider that. It's absolutely well, mind-blowing. this is what we talked about. We did discuss this the last time and I, thought, I think it's so fascinating that, you know, if, we, if we're doing, if we're studying an animal, you know, that we just found somewhere, like all the stuff that we look into, like their sleep patterns, the food they eat, when they sleep, we take in that all into account. A human comes in to the doctor's and office. And none of it applies. None yeah. of that yeah. applies. Yeah. Yeah. How does that make sense? Like, why do we do that for some animal across the world that we've never met before yeah. and we're trying to figure everything about it? But then if a human comes walking yeah. in and says, I've got this issue and it's just like, no, no, all those things yeah. don't matter. Oh, so you're a shift worker. You have poor relationships. Um, you eat terribly. Uh, well, you, you just have a, a statin deficiency. Like, like clearly, that, that's the issue. You know, it's not. We not, need to give you more statins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which so, they just had a great uh, research article on on statins, and it was basically like statins accelerate atherosclerosis. They are a, a, a calcifying agent, and uh, absolutely no. Or, or very, very suspicious justification for recommendations. It's a statins. very narrow, narrow slice of the population that may benefit from right. statins. But the reason why they're so prescribed is because we made it. It's funny, too, by the way, because we see this in the supplement industry where they'll take something and then they'll hammer that particular piece of information because they have something that can directly affect that. In other words, let's hammer cholesterol. Uh, as like, this is the cause of everything, and then, oh, here we go, take this medication, and it fixes your cholesterol right. numbers, and that's the cure. And because we're sold so hard on cholesterol being the, the, the cause of everything, now it's easy to prescribe. Well, that reminds Stands me of what we're seeing right now, and we called this years ago with the, the ketogenic diet, because now it's become, you know, it's, it's introduced, now it's awesome, what do we do? Now we make a supplement, and we try and do that. What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on... Yes, we got to go here, dude. Uh, we got to go here. Because we called this. We called it uh, two plus years two ago. Two years ago, literally on the podcast, we were talking about it. And I said, it's a matter of time before supplement companies jump on the keto bandwagon and then oh, yeah. sell keto you everything. keto supplements. And now that's the thing. Where I'm seeing it already now. All the all the celebrities, yeah. all the people. Now with beta hydroxybutyrate. You know, testing, got- <laughs> testing their pee to make sure they're in ketosis oh, and man. taking their, their supplement to get them in ketosis. Meanwhile, they're not sleeping. They're stressed as fuck. All this other and thing. And their diet shit. <laughs> So what was the question? No, yeah. I, 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 it, it's super frustrating for me because I think um, whatever type of exogenous ketones we're talking about, there's huge therapeutic potential there. You know, like they vetted a bunch of this stuff out with like Navy SEAL divers and, right. and uh, the We had uh, Dom, we talked all about yeah. this. So there's huge therapeutic potential on on the one hand, but then it's, it, and, you know, it's funny, uh, some of the worst offenders of this stuff of basically suggesting that exogenous ketones are equivalent to being in a ketogenic state and fat burning early in their life cycle. Th- this was the messaging and it was kind of a wink, wink, nod, mm-hmm. nod, but we'll, we'll just jam that out. Um, uh, through back channel stuff. I've heard that some of these companies have made, you know, 60, $70 million a year off this stuff. Yep. And so it's kind of like, well, they're a lot more successful than I am, but I have some ethical concerns around that. Uh, you know, like I have seen screen captures where somebody says, I just ate most of a chocolate cake. I blew my ketogenic diet. What do I do? And they're like, no, man, just slam some of the, the ketone salts and you'll be right back into ketosis. So we're taking somebody and we're going to have sky high blood glucose levels and super high ketone body levels, a state that we only see in the most uh, fucked up of medical scenarios, wow, like diabetic ketoacidosis. Yeah. You don't see yeah, that no. naturally. No, no. no. and the two should be as, as antagonistic of one another as you what could possibly get. What a great get. fucking point. Yeah. And I could see some potentially huge problems with that. Now, there are some scenarios where you have somebody who's a high-end like athlete, and there's some some suggestion that, say, like a ketone ester plus elevated glucose sure, levels sure. at the right time, we may get some enhanced performance. Is elite athletic performance t- completely congruent with, with, you know, health and longevity? Not at all. No, no. not really, you know. <laughs> so, that it's so but, but we've got a bunch of nuance and caveat with that. And so on the one hand, I really don't want to throw these products out because they could be really efficacious right. for a, a wide variety of situations, in particular like this uh, spec op scene. Like the, those guys need every bit of support sure. that we can – throw to them. So I don't want to completely shit can them on, on that regard. But then we have all these folks that are kind of being fed a line of goods, but you know, well, context is so important, right? Like ketones probably good for you in this context, change the context in a high carbohydrate 
you know, situation, who knows? And maybe not, and probably not. Right. And, and you know, so we could beat up on the, the ketone, the exogenous ketones, but I see people doing something as injurious and not scientifically credible just in the recommendations of fat bombs for people. Mm. <laughs> so just throw this to add this to your diet. Ju- yeah, mm. just uh, you know, uh, so I We could take a bulletproof coffee for that one. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. Right? <laughs> it's and so it, weird 600 calorie coffee in the morning. I don't have to eat for another 6 hours. It really holds me over. Yeah. <laughs> and and again, there are situations where that's great, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, but Well, we and th- let me say, say that too. We all use that, right? Yeah. right. Do that. I I do yeah, it yeah, yeah. frequently. Yeah, but that that's on the day that I'm going to probably end up burning 4000 calories between jujitsu doing farm work and, and everything else. And it's kind of like, yeah, I, I, I need that as a, as a prop. But I, I saw, a, again, another screen capture where there was a person who was like, I had five cups of coffee today. Each cup of coffee, I had a half a cup of cream in it. And it, it, I'm not in ketosis. And I know why it was the 10 grams of sugar that was in the, fi- you know, the uh, three and a half cups of, of whole cream. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, no, it definitely wasn't the 1800 calories that you <laughs> consume. Now, now potentially that, that should actually allow you to be in ketosis or whatever, but they've, they've been doing this for a while. And the person was reporting that their, their weight loss is stalled and everything. Or there was like, everybody in this group was like, yeah, it's the sugar. It's the sugar. Maybe you could find a lower, lower carb cream or use creme froche because it, it's fermented. And so the carbohydrates oh been God. reduced. That is crazy, Bill. And, and there are subsections of this ketogenic diet world where they're basically telling you to eat oil because any amount of protein releases an insulin response. And so you're, you're reduced to eating oil. So you get no vitamins, no minerals. Um, oil is probably satiating up to a point, but protein is arguably more satiating and it's actually healthy. So, you know, I'm in this kind of... Uh, a keto gains camp where it, it's get pretty reasonably high protein and high is kind of a relative deal. If you have a fat loss goal and use protein to suppress appetite, eat as much nutrient dense vegetable matter as you can. So that, you know, you stay under that carbohydrate threshold of, of uh, really suppressing a, a potential fat burning and, or just caloric deficit. You know, I mean, that, that, it, so long as we get a, mm. an easy caloric deficit introduced with adequate protein and some resistance training, magic is going to yeah. happen, you know? <laughs> now, speaking of protein, what do you think? Cause uh, we coming from the, the fitness world and the muscle building world, like protein is the magic macronutrient. You can't get enough, eat more and more and more. And it's better for you. What do you think about uh, occasional protein fasting or going low protein sometimes? I, I think that's brilliant. And, you know, some of the stuff I've been playing with at, at, as a result of kind of learning about this stuff. So we've got these dueling banjos of things like mTOR and insulin, ver, you know, uh, versus the anabolic effects that, mm. that we want and whatnot. And Art Devaney, again, I just have to give that that guy a hat tip. He's like, don't just don't be fucking chronic about it. It's like dummies, you know, just be intermittent. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, uh, dinner happens at 5 p.m. You eat breakfast at maybe 9 a.m., maybe 10 a.m., big protein meal, and then maybe you don't eat again. Or if you do eat, it's it's just carbs or it's just fat. And then you go until dinner and then you have another protein mm-hmm. meal. And those two protein meals, like for me, if I want like 130, 140 grams of protein mm-hmm. total, then each of those meals, you know, is, is a half of that. And I've been playing around with that. And I'm like, man, I feel pretty good. And I'm leaner. My performance is good. Mm-hmm. Um, oftentimes I just skip that afternoon meal because I just wrapped up jits. And I'm like, okay, it's two o'clock. We're going to eat at five. Okay, maybe I'll do a Mark Sissing collagen bar, and yeah. I, I do that, and and so I do a, a, like a collagen protein in the intermediate, or I don't do anything. It just and, seems to me like anything you expose your body to, a, anything, hormones, food, whatever, over a period of time, your body becomes desensitized to it, and it seems like, and there is some evidence, and I can't recite the study, unfortunately. I usually can, but I can't remember, but there is some evidence to show that if you consume high protein all the time, very frequently, you actually become less efficient with it yeah. and you use it more for energy than for muscle building. There's a there's a, a couple of studies that showed that actually a single protein meal a day was more anabolic than multiple feedings. Now, you need to really get in and eat. Like mm-hmm. You've got to have the day's allotment, but the body is actually much more efficient with it versus using it as an mm-hmm. energy substrate. And I, yeah. So I personally will do a, a one vegan day a week and it's not... Uh, it's usually just high vegetable, very low ca- calories, low protein, and I get I definitely notice an anabolic effect the day after, and I just feel 
uh, so much better doing right. it. And it, you know, protein also in high amounts over you know frequently all the time can have some. It seems like there's evidence for that it will accelerate you know signs of aging. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's probably a good idea. And from an evolutionary standpoint. It makes perfect sense, yeah. right? Yeah. And Just mTOR, mTOR is in certain contexts is fantastic, but in the wrong context, that's a pro cancer. Right. You know, you don't want to you don't want to necessarily blast mTOR all the time if you're in the wrong context, or right? You know, you know, wrong health. Right. So uh, here's a good question for you that might get controversial. What is and you might hate it, but what is more important, <laughs> food quantity or food quality? Oh man, um, my clinical experience in general if we chase the quality story first then the quantity story is addressed and and uh, this is what got me kicked out of crossfit ultimately yeah, other backstory but this was <laughs> oh, really? this, this, you know but this, go was, there next. this was the the <laughs> sand in the wheels you know because mm. of the zone and and all that type of stuff which i i think is all great but uh, so on the autoimmune side and also it's a little bit context driven can we weigh and measure ourselves out of autoimmunity? No, not with the wrong the wrong foods. Like you just, and this is part of the problem is that they had looked at a standard American diet and various sliced and dice deals with GI problems with autoimmune disease, and there's like there's no effect of diet on these diseases, and that's no, that's not the case. There's no effect of the same diet in different ratios on these mm-hmm. diseases. So depending on like health condition and disease state, like uh, gastrointestinal issues, autoimmune issues, the food quality may be way more important than the amount. That's everything. They, I would then agree. you'll then you'll have people jump in and they're like, "Well, if they eat ten thousand calories a day of it, then they're gonna die." Like, okay, do we, we do have some non ridiculous parameters that mm-hmm. we put around this stuff? Yeah, it, but ah, how many times is- have you actually seen somebody eat ten thousand calories? <laughs> I, I used to say as a trainer. Go try. Eat. It, Here's your foods I want you to eat from. Good luck I, I swear 80% of my life now is providing legal disclaimers for the, <laughs> the fucking jerk-offs on the internet. That, right. that, that Get the, the like mm-hmm. sixth standard deviation, you know, thing that, that happens uh, less frequently than the appearance of the universe. Right. You know? <laughs> right. And, 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 I'm trying to... I'm trying well, to it could happen, man. It I'm trying happen. to help the majority, yeah. you asshole, while you're over here right. it, it, it just seems arguing to, over semantics. It, it just seems ridiculous. to me that when you, have, when you focus on food quality... Your your sip your your natural signals of satiety and hunger are so much they're just in better balance. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and and so a really good point of illustration of that is that if we have a skinny kid that's geeked out on paleo and he's lifting weights and he wants to gain weight for football, we may need to tweak that because it's so satiating he won't be able to eat enough right. calories. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we actually need to tweak those parameters. It's like, hey, we're going to throw in some rice. We'll throw in some dairy. We may throw in a slice or two of apple pie here and there just to actually like prime that pump because the, because these whole unprocessed foods are so satiating that if we have a situation where somebody needs to consume a significant amount of food, it may not be up to the task. And I, I that is kind of an interesting you know, juxtaposition to this whole mm-hmm. thing. So right. yeah, I mean, I would generally say that the food quality is is where it really starts. Now, clearly, if we want to get to like figure competitor level of leanness and stuff yeah. like that, we've got to start weighing and totally measuring different. food. But but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just a, a really kind of nervous about like the impending implosion of our economy and our healthcare system due to diabetes. And everybody else is, you know, and so all these guys are like, well, I train NBA players and, and you know, you need to weigh and measure food. I'm like, okay, fuck, whatever, man. <laughs> yeah. when, yeah. when, when society falls, you don't have dry food or interlocking grids of fire. I do, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let me ask you, because you uh, about gluten, you had mentioned several times uh, about, um, you know, serving your kids like gluten-free, uh, you know, waffles or whatnot. Um, here's an interesting anecdote I've heard from many, many people, clients, and I've even experienced this myself and I find it very, very strange. I have now, um, uh, just because now I've been able to identify and eat so much better and take care of my body. I now have a, what I would consider kind of low level gluten intolerance, although I still have an intolerance to it. However, when I travel to Italy or to Europe, the same gluten there, uh, or maybe it's not the same gluten, but gluten there does not affect me nearly as bad. And I've heard this from many, many, many yeah. clients. Now, my theory, or, or I'm, what I'm deducing from this, is I know that in the U.S. here, um, glyphosates are used as a desiccant on wheat many times. So they spray the hell out of wheat. And although wheat isn't a GMO, they use the glyphosates to dry them or to get them to 
uh, you know, ready right. to harvest much quicker. Whereas in Europe, they don't use that process. And if they do, they have to label it. Is that the difference or are we just making things up or is there really an inherent issue with gluten or is it more the glyphosates or both? So, I mean, for, for humans in general, gluten has always been a bit of an issue. And uh, uh, when you look at the, if you do, this is always some interesting stuff. You do evolutionary advantage and then disease. So you do evolutionary advantage celiac. And the evolutionary advantage, advantage of celiac disease is that these folks have a disproportionately elevated immune response in the gut. And these tend to be people who, if you look at their uh, derivations, tend to come out of these early farming communities of, of where humans started living in proximity to each other and animals and an enhanced gut uh, immune response. Kept them alive. Kept them alive. Mm. Now, the, the, uh, some of the proteins in gluten, though, can trigger an overactive immune response and zonulin release and intestinal permeability. So this is the, the uh, uh, trade-off with some of that stuff. So that's a piece. There's an inherent potentiality of this anti-predation chemical in wheat for being problematic. If you look at the European varieties of wheat and the way that they use them, in the United States, when we make bread and, and pastry-type products, we use concentrated gluten to enhance those products. Oh, so, so we add we more. We are just adding wow. more, oh, wow. yeah, which is, is kind of an interesting deal. Really interesting story. So in kind of researching this autoimmune paleo diet, I, I wanted to make a point that it's in its early stages and we're, we just had a pilot study and then things move along. And I wanted to show that same historical process for the Mediterranean diet. There was a point in time when nobody knew what a Mediterranean diet was. And then somebody suggested this and then there was a pi there was a review paper which is the first thing and then people get curious enough about it to do a pilot study and then then it goes from there interestingly though if you go to the wikipedia page for mediterranean diet one of the references there is gluten intolerance i'm like oh that's interesting there's a link there to a, a recently done paper that suggests that globally the uh uh Incidence of gluten intolerance and celiac disease has increased as a consequence of recommending the Mediterranean diet to the world. Mm -hmm. And so wow. we've recommended wheat. And so this was interesting. This is a whole other like, mm -hmm. like rabbit, rabbit hole, hole. <laughs> that, I've, that I've gone down. And they mentioned both the potential of the glyphosate issue and also just the fact that the type of wheat that we use and the wheat containing products, we tend to in enhance. We, if you assume um, gluten to be a potentially toxic substance, um, which is com completely fits all the parameters of that, it's non-hyperbolic, it's not unscientific, fits all those, those definitions, and we add more to it, then we're, we're increasing the toxicant mm -hmm. load. We tend to do more antibiotics in the United States than elsewhere. Um, we have more C-sections, so you've got gut di dysbiotic issues. Uh, there was a study, and I'm sorry I'm bouncing around. No, I love it. This no, yeah, no, keep going. going. Big picture. Um there was a study where they took kids with celiac and they did a uh, fecal transplant on them. And I think like eight out of the 10 kids then were no longer celiac. So they could wow. eat gluten and not have the mm. celiac reaction. So we, uh, you know, we have enzymes that can break down different nutrients, but we, we kind of forget that these, these gut bacteria that ride along with us, they can do a hell of a job processing different nutrients. And so is a bunch of the problem that we have, you know, just lost a, a microbiotic, uh, you know, constituent that could help degrade this stuff. I think it's all of these, these things. The interesting thing about the Roundup story is the Roundup is suspected to be a mitochondrial toxin, a mitochondrial disruptor. And so in addition to just the celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitivity issues that we see, these folks tend to have a bunch of other interrelated problems, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, multiple chemical sensitivities, which deals with detox, that, that's, you know, liver mitochondrial activity and all, all the other, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, organelles that are involved with that. So th there's a lot of different moving parts to this thing. And, uh, but I have heard consistently that people will go from Italy to here, eat our wheat products. And they're like, dude, that crushed me. Or conversely, they go to Italy or, or somewhere else in Europe. They have a scone or, or some, you know, whatever there and they don't have I, I kept hearing yeah. it from my clients and I experienced it myself when I went there and ate the bread and the pasta and I would expect I was expecting like this major reaction and I didn't have one right and it blew me the fuck away. And then and when you I thought came it was back, the glyphosate, right? So that's well. Cool. I, I, I mean, I'm I'm just trying to put you know pieces together to figure out why this would be the case. And it, if it's the glyphosate issue, then I would be. It would be unlikely that you would experience that 
immediate kind of GI response because the glyphosate, to my understanding, takes some is, time. It takes some time, and it's more this mitochondrial disruptor deal. Mm-hmm. So that in that situation, I would be leaning more towards, towards the more gluten. That makes <laughs> more uh, gluten, that makes yeah. ap- absolutely yeah. perfect sense. So. Yeah. Very interesting. And then uh, going back, there was a topic, there was a, something I did want to bring up when we were talking about the exogenous ketones. So I, uh, I've i done very, very well keto-ish um, because I tend to have autoimmune issues when it mm-hmm. comes to my digestion. Although recently I seem to have gotten a lot better and I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. But I've, always, I've messed around with the exogenous ketones and I noticed uh, if I pushed my exogenous ketone consumption along with a ketogenic diet to the point where I had really high levels of, of ketones, I would be far more susceptible to uh, uh, fungal infections. Oh, interesting. And uh, I did do a little bit of research and I found that there that some certain funguses uh, can feed off of ketones. And so although you may be killing off some bacteria that may be doing some harm to you, you may be feeding other things that may cause problems. It just goes to show that balance... Uh, yeah. is very, very important. Oh, that's fascinating. I mean, uh, a few people like Grace Liu mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, oh God, uh, Mike, uh, I can't believe I'm... Ruscio? Ruscio, yeah. God, he's oh, going yeah, to punch me yeah, in the it's face it's the a, it's next time he sees me for getting <laughs> his last name. But um, uh, both of those people have mentioned small intestinal fungal overgrowth as being this thing that is like that's flying right. under the radar and like the biofilms and all that type of stuff. But I had not... Man, uh, uh, yeah, you could get a really wacky bloom because, I mean, how often are your guts just swimming with ketones? With ketones, with that free many, ketones. Because I was pushing yeah. them through the roof, and I did it several times, and every single time I'd get athlete's foot, which I never get, uh, and I have no reason. Yeah, and I was like, huh. oh, shit, it's the ketones. Pretty crazy. And then more recently, I did, which seems to be... Okay, so, uh, you know, my nutrition... This is Mike's recommendation, right? Wasn't this... Mike recommended this to me, Dr. Ruscio. Mm -hmm. So, my diet dialed, uh, you know, in terms of I know what I can eat, what I can't eat, what's going to work for me. You know, sleep was good, exercise was good, but still always hypersensitive. Still always, if I have a little bit of too much of this or that, or I don't have enough vegetables, I'm going to have gut problems. And it was really a pain in the ass, no pun intended. And uh, he recommended that I do a course of antimicrobial... You know, not you know herbs mm-hmm, or whatever, mm-hmm. and I did these. You know, I, I did I, the exact same protocol with like the Saccharomyces boulardii and the the. Uh, there's like eight different bottles that you end up with, and well, the schedule, and, yeah. and I, I so I started with the fast, and then I took these you know these supplements. I had a you know what they would call a Herxheimer effect, although I don't know if that how. Uh, you know, if that's a real thing, but um, where I had this kind of reaction for a couple days, and then I felt better, and I did that twice, and I swear to God, my gut has never been better or healthier, it's almost like I had to go in and kill right. a bunch of shit. And you did the same I thing. I did the same thing. And, and how did it work for you? You know, it's funny. So I did it for a month and I felt good up until a month. I was heading into month two and then I felt crushed. Like it felt terrible. So I went off of it and I, I would have some kind of ups and downs. And then I did a month of keto while I was rehabbing my my MCL strain. And, uh, and it's interesting. During that time, I, I'm doing some work with the Tommy Woods at, at a Nourish Balance Thrive. And so I, they did some stool samples and everything. They sent me the report on it. And I, I don't really know how to interpret these things, but they're like, dude, this is the healthiest gut we've seen out of <laughs> working with like 2,000 people. I'm like, dude, if mine's the healthiest gut, like all these other people were probably like nearly dead. It, but it was after doing this this intervention. And, and since then, um, my car- carb tolerance has been better. Like I still definitely have certain things, you know, like carrots I do great with. Applesauce I do well with. Uh, raw apples, uh, they don't digest, and I'm like tutti frutti, you know, two hours after eating them, and and they, they it just nothing good happens with so it. What so. I noticed, which was really fascinating, was uh, up until this point, my stimulant tolerance was poor. Like I'd mm-hmm. have caffeine, my stimulant tolerance is better now. now. What yeah. what is that? Do you think it's just the cortisol response, and maybe because the immune reaction isn't so strong? Because I literally could handle 100 milligrams of caffeine, and that was it. Any more. And I would be anxious and just feel terrible. And now it's like caffeine, it just feels great. It, it definitely, you know, and it's funny because genetically I'm a slow metabolizer, so I'm never going to be that like 10 I'm the same way, guy, the whole liver enzyme. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, I mean, the, uh, I don't know, but it definitely like that um, corticosteroid kind of kind of release under a, a stress scenario. Definitely like if we, if we just have intestinal permeability, that is a low-grade stress and we're going to have a... A cortisol response, you you know, 
coming mm. about that. And also the liver is impacted that way because it's dealing with LPS. So some of the detox pathways are dealing with the, the cellular byproducts of the, the bacterial fermentation and whatnot. And so if the liver, is, and it's different pathways potentially, but if the liver is super bogged down dealing with this, then it may be less able to deal with the caffeine. Wow, that's very fascinating. So yeah. before we, we sign off, I, I have to ask you your opinion. Uh, I know our audience will kill us if we don't on the documentary, What the Health. I know <clears> you did a thing on it. And it's a little old news now. We've hammered it to death, but our, our audience is like, you got to ask Rob. Man, so on the one hand, the, the, the greatest frustration I have with these guys is that they did a really, really good job of uncorber, uh, uncovering the, the relationship between um, these mega corporations and our food supply. That part of the film is is spot on and is, is bulletproof. And <clears throat> whether you're vegan or not, the, the thing that, that is damaging about the way they handle things, they just wantonly ignored it or misrepresented a, a huge number of scientific papers. Like they just just outright lied um, or because they're not that big of idiots. You can't make a movie that looks this nice and be dumb. Right. So these people aren't dumb, but they, they were duplicitous. And what they ended up doing in the, pro the process. So one of the examples, like they, they cited a study about uh, – Dairy products increasing cancer. I forget what it, what one of the the points was. Um, one, it's a, a food frequency questionnaire deal, which I you know just put no credit in those things. But uh, full fat dairy was benign, even beneficial. Low fat dairy was problematic, and they didn't distinguish between the two. Yeah. So that is wantonly like nefarious. There, mm -hmm. There's something really problematic there. But let's let's just back up a little bit and say that all the vegan land stuff is correct more or less, um, but they misrepresent this data, but then they were right about the collusion between corporations and our food supply and all these problems. When they get the science wrong and they are easily verified as lying about the science, then the good work that they did in exposing the food also. industry is also thrown out. So this is the problem of turning anything like, like veganism into a religion such that you ignore the facts because these guys could have kind of a credible position to go in and we start saying, hey, we need to decouple big, you know, the big money from our food supply and, and uh, farm subsidies need to go away. And um, you could have a really credible position with that if you treat the science properly. But because they did a shitty treatment of the science, then their message about the bigger picture of corporatism as it relates to our, our food supply, it's just gone. Mm -hmm. It has no credibility. And there was actually a vegan registered dietitian, masters of public health, who did a, almost as lengthy a, a takedown of the movie as I did, and she raised exactly the same concerns. Mm. And, and the irony to me is pointing out the, the, the cronyism in the, in the food supply, but then forgetting that some of the biggest... Uh, well, they were, they were saying it was all the meat owners, yeah. it, it, the meat suppliers. The thing about that that is absolute bullshit... They own the meat, they own the wheat, they own the sugar. <laughs> exactly. It's not separated. And no. that's where it's just just absolute bullshit, yeah. you know. Yeah, it, it, to us, we kind of <laughs> interpreted it as uh, vegan propaganda in the sense that they were, they're very driven by their moral op you know, uh, op opposition to eating meat. And so they're trying to make a case to get everybody to stop eating meat. It's no, but it's not based on, the fa on health. It's just, right. we don't want to eat meat, so let's try and... Lie to everybody. Oh, well, when you draw case. parallels to what was eggs and cigarettes, it, right? Two eggs is like yeah. giving your kid like a pack of cigarettes for breakfast, like right. <laughs> and and you know, I, I don't know if you guys want to unpack all that stuff, but there was a tiny subset of people that were hyper responders to dietary cholesterol, and it, but even then, it, this begs the question. We just had this statin, mm -hmm. you know, discussion. So there there are some people who are hyper responders to cholesterol and and so and i mean again it's a really really small piece of the overall pie but if they consume eggs they do get an elevation in cholesterol levels which still begs the question did it just raise right. cholesterol is did it, it bad? raise lipoproteins <laughs> does it have any bearing on anything particularly because you're supplying uh, choline and lecithin and, and antioxidants in the, in the egg. Even the shitty shittiest eggs have have some remarkable uh, uh, nutritional quality. So that's all, you know, uh, completely, you know, a, a bunch of stuff to unpack. And they extrapolated it to the totality of the population and said everybody responds exactly the same way, and that it's correlated to like a fifteen, you know, cigarette a day habit. And and 
you know, if you're going to throw stuff out like that, although people say ridiculous shit all the time. So I, I guess it, 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 it's, <laughs> yeah. well, it, this it's one actually, works. and I think why we, we came out, did an episode and we've talked about it and probably hammered it to death was I was surprised on how much, how many people it impacted. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was, like, I would, my phone and messages and seeing people all of a sudden, Oh, I'm going vegan now. And I was like, Oh my God, really sheep. Everybody come on. Seriously. <laughs> right. Cigarettes, eggs, come on, that right away. And we're racist if we eat uh, pork it? or yeah, something yeah. like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was my favorite one. But, but and uh, definitely this will get the listenership down. But I mean, if you can politicize anything right now and try to make it a race or gender issue, oh, gosh. then it's there. And, and Just when I thought I couldn't like you anymore. <laughs> You say oh, something dude. like that. <laughs> well, and, and let, divide let, and conquer. Let, let's let's be honest. What if you show me a, uh, a a Republican vegan or a conservative vegan? Then um, you, what you are showing me is someone who probably saw an animal slaughtered in their their youth, and they just can't even deal with the thought of eating meat. Mm-hmm. It's got nothing else to do with anything. But I mean the 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 political divide in this this whole story. So it's interesting, like the global warming stories and, and uh, God, the social justice kind of element to it. But dude, that's sexy. And if you, if you even just try to have a discussion about it, I'm not even saying arguing, but if you just ask some questions like, well, better educate me on this. You know, it's like, you are an asshole immediately. You know, and it's like, <laughs> okay. And, and uh, God, I don't know if you guys have followed any of the Jordan Peterson stuff, you know, like Rogan and all that jive. Like, um, People don't appreciate that this um, uh, there's a a constant cycling and backlash, and and when the kind of lunatic fringe left goes crazy, there's a chunk of kind of centrist individuals that migrate to the right uh-huh. and migrate to the right, and then what they've done is anybody who is there's a race to the bottom in the uh, the marginalization deal, so. I don't know. You could be a little ethnic, possibly. So you are more marginalized than I am because I'm clearly Whitey right. McWhiterkins. So we've You're got a about layer the oppression there. Olympics. <laughs> yeah, the oppression Olympics. <laughs> but then, whoever is at the bottom of that thing, everybody else is an oppressor, and they get sick of fucking being an oppressor yeah. for just having a pulse. And then you start peeling people. Mm. And what's scary is the right is well armed, well organized. And if you want to radicalize that scene, you could have some really shitty yeah. stuff go down, and people just don't. No, it's uh, it's crazy, but it, yeah. And it, you guys may want to edit all this shit out. <laughs> I, 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 I oh, would blame you. So so. We're going to stop soon, only because I'll get going with you, and this will turn into <laughs> yeah. something completely yeah, different. But yeah, if, if you can politicize, they, they will politicize anything, including diet, because if you ask the average person, how does a liberal typically eat, or how does a conservative typically eat, they will give you diets that they think that they right. eat because it's been so politicized although diet has fucking nothing to do with any any of it so right anyway man always always a pleasure talking yeah, to honor you. being with you guys yeah, yeah. You excellent brother well thanks again thank you guys excellent yeah. so go to YouTube check out Mind Pump TV there's a new video posted every single day also we're still offering 30 days of coaching it's for free it's at mindpumpmedia.com thank you for listening to Mind Pump if your goal is to build and shape your body dramatically improve your health and energy and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.